I don't know if there's any short answer to it, but I guess the key message is that a totally tree dominated an iron ash dominated landscape in this environment is not healthy, not the answer to climate change. Healthy functioning grasslands with good percentage of trees and, and, and iron ash is, and if we could get that out to the wider community, it'd be fantastic, but that's a long battle, I think. <laughs> My name is Andrew Mosley from Metawanda Station in Western New South Wales, about 90 k south of Cobar, just off the Kidman Way. We run a uh, mixed livestock enterprise, white dorper sheep, cattle, and um, manage meat goats, yep. 20,000 hectares, and we uh, lease another 6,000 hectares, primarily a grazing operation, with some opportunity of cropping. Yeah, I grew up here. I remember it as an open grassland type environment. There were paddocks there you could ride, yeah, ride through and see for quite a distance. My uncle talks about, you know, paddocks five by five kilometres that you could see right across and, you know, muster on with a horse and dog, a couple of people and dogs, but you wouldn't do that in a, a lot of these <laughs> landscapes now. It's a timbered bimble box pine community. It was an open grassland originally. There's been invasions of uh, cypress pine and the eucalypt species and the INS species like Eremophila species that, that have encroached on the landscape. INS, invasive native scrub, so they're native species that have spread outside their natural domain and then they're now in, in uh, densities that are far exceed what they were say 200 years ago in their natural natural environment where they're, they're part of the part of the landscape but not in the densities that they are now they've invaded areas that they weren't in before and they're in densities far exceeding what they were in a natural healthy functioning uh, landscape I suppose it start like there was recruitment events in the in the 50s and the 70s and then the following the big fires in the early 80s um, really sped that thickening up. The manage became a lot more difficult. You couldn't, you know, couldn't muster areas, couldn't find stock, growing less grass, declining soil organic matter. The soil was hardening and we're getting that hard capped soil, so a lot of runoff with very little biomass production because the, the ground would dry out quickly. So that leads, you know, to declining productivity whether you're trying to run a, a grazing business or whether you're trying to support native herbivores and that they depend on the biomass production, they don't all feed off, you know, trees. We really started to see some issues come to a head, so carrying capacities for, the, for these properties really hit a low point, productivity hit a low point, and so there were some real issues in terms of the viability of these places that came to a head in the, in the early 90s. When my wife and I, Megan, returned to the property in 97, we wanted to run a, a viable and successful grazing business and we kept hitting barriers that made that quite difficult. Our productivity wasn't high enough to have a viable enterprise. Our land care group trained in holistic management in the early 90s, the whole family did the training. It started to offer up some answers to why the invasion had take place and, and the declining productivity in our landscape. That's given us the, the framework to develop some of our thinking and, and the, the ideas from the HM framework that we've adapted and used in this landscape and seen that keeping your ground covered, looking after your perennial grasses, it, it really does work and it's crucial to getting this, restoring this landscape and environment. We started to realise that we had to have control over the greater area in terms of total grazing pressure. Again, to get some rest into our landscape, allow the plants to to reach their full potential to grow when the opportunity was there and then manage how they were harvested and, and used. So that meant a good perimeter fencing with internal fencing, however you want to do that, to give us more paddocks, give us more flexibility so that we can move animals around, we can shut areas up at different times, manage our, our rest range limbs, and it's rest is the critical part. Like Grasses need a chance to, to grow and flourish and put down root mass and get ready for the next dry period, so it's a critical part of the, the equation. TGP fencing, it's a type of fencing that, that will control 90% of the grazing pressure. So feral goats keep livestock where they're meant to be, restrict the movement of the kangaroo so that we can get some uh, rest into that landscape. We can always open gates and allow the roos in to move if we need to. To maintain that, that ground cover and that dry feed through those tighter periods, it's crucial whether we have that TGP with total grazing pressure quality fence around the perimeter. 
got TJP fence around the whole 20,000 hectares. We're up to about 80 paddocks now. We've got the enterprise mix we want. We've got the numbers, we're running the numbers we want. We've got data to show that we've doubled our DSC days per hectare per 100 mils of rainfall over the last 15 years. So we've doubled our carrying capacity. We're running more animals on a small area than the mum and dad did. And we've got much better ground cover, a better diversity of species. So there's, we're seeing you know, those good perennials in areas that we didn't previously see them. And we're starting to see you know, a better balance returning to the, to the landscape. So we're always under the assumption that INS was the problem. Really in hindsight, we've come to understand it's a, it's a symptom of previous management regimes and climate regimes. So yeah, climate in you know, a different you know, seasonal conditions has, has led to the thickening that we've seen. But it's a symptom, it's not the major issue that we were so co concerned about 25 years ago. We're dealing with it and trying to rectify some of those changes. But we now understand that if we get our soil management right, keep our soils covered, look after our perennials. We're now, now seeing you know, the landscape shift back towards that scattered open grassland type environment. So we're seeing, actually seeing areas where the soil's improving, that we've got iron air species that are dying just through the change in, in, in management and ground cover. So you've got you know, well-grassed areas and the turpentine, which is one of the hardest ones to, to really deal with, it's dying because it's, you know, it's obviously moved, shifted out of its conditions that it needs to thrive. That's pretty fascinating, pretty interesting to see that starting to take place. We spun our wheels for a long time, but now it's starting to reach that critical level. The landscape's starting to catch up again. It's starting to get its function going again, it's starting to work how it should. And so we're starting to see some of these things happen without us having to go out and do everything to try and make those changes happen. We're growing grass in places we thought we'd never grow grass before, and you know, lots of it, which is bloody satisfying. <laughs>